This episode is sponsored by Linode. Linode is offering listeners of this podcast a $20 credit, which is good for four free months at their lowest plan. Their plans start at one gigabyte of RAM for $5 a month. You can get your servers in any of their 10 data centers, and their high memory plans start at 16 gigabytes. Get a server running in under a minute. They do hourly billing with a monthly cap on all plans and add-on services like backups, node balancers, long view, etc. VMs for full control, running Docker containers, encrypted disks, VPNs, etc. You can run a private Git server. They provide native SSD storage, 200 gigabit network, and Intel E5 processors. They have 24-7 friendly support, even on holidays, and a seven-day money-back guaranteed. So go check them out at linode.com slash JavaScript Jabber. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of JavaScript Jabber. This week on our panel, we have AJ O'Neill. Yo, 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 coming at you live from Provo. Amy Knight. Hello from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, Joe Eames. He had to step out for a minute, so he'll probably be back here in a second. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. A uh, quick shout out reminder about React Dev Summit and JS Dev Summit. Uh, React Dev Summit's March 26th through 30th. Um, I didn't check the timing before this, so if it's already happened, you can still uh, sign up and get the videos. Um, JS Dev Summit's coming up mid May, so don't miss that. Uh, you can find it at jsdevsummit.com. We should have speakers up soon, and you should be able to check out what we're doing there. Uh, we have a special guest this week, and that's Orta Thorox. Hey, everyone. I am on the 27th floor of a uh, skyscraper in Manhattan. Very cool. Uh, we brought you on to talk about this tool called Danger. Sounds All right. dangerous. Dangerous. There's your dad yeah. joke for the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been hearing those for so many years. Yeah, I'll bet. Do you want to explain really briefly what it is? Yeah, sure. Um so danger comes from this kind of need of being able to uh, make requests of people in pull requests in a really polite, mechanized way. So imagine if your project, uh, like I came from the iOS world, and whenever you make a new version of an app, you always want to be writing a changelog. So imagine if you could have a bot that every time someone makes a pull request, it requests that they add a changelog entry. And so Danger is basically that thing. We call it the, the ability to create cultural rules about your kind of pull request workflow. The stuff that I was reading said, um, and I'm sure we'll get into this, but just that you kind of think of it as being on the PR level as opposed to like the file level. Is that true? Yeah. So uh, basically it provides like a, an eval context. So you, you can execute uh, like code. And so you can basically do anything you want with the metadata from the pull request to kind of turn it into something useful. So uh, an interesting example is I run a node app, um, and if someone adds a new dependency, um, we'll actually look at the diff between the package.json on every single PR. If there's a new dependency added into the dependence, uh, the dependencies like uh, key, then it will actually pull out the readme for it and give some metadata like what license it is and uh, you know how many stars uh, and try and give you like rich context around the addition of a new dependency onto your project. It's pretty intense, right? Pretty cool. Sounds kind of nice. So it generally com ends up being used on much larger projects. Um, for example, we, we tend to use it, at least in the open source world, we tend to use it um, on a dependency manager that I run for the iOS world and... We use it on all our internal tools where I work at Artsy, but like big JavaScript projects that people will have heard of that use it, are like React, uh, React Native, um, pretty sure Apollo use it, and RxJS. And so a lot of them use it to kind of, uh, you know, coordinate documentation changes, keep up to date with semantic versioning. Um, and so it's what started off with this very simple, like, I want to see if a changelog uh, entry has been made. You can start to create these really kind of complex rules about what has changed and how you can present that to people in a pull request. One thing that I was reading in your issues that looked really cool, so like something like this, um, I don't know who was talking about this, but um, if you have um, like linting set up and a lot of linters will have like like a command you can run to like automatically fix certain rules. So if, you, if somebody put up a PR and it violated some linting rules, then like another PR could be automatically made that fixes some of those rules just by running that command. Yeah, that's totally feasible. 
uh, like at that point, it's really just all about the GitHub API and just running some of this code at runtime. Um, we've been experimenting with like moving Danger onto a server, so you can do any kind of like GitHub style webhook, and then you can just start doing any sort of interesting work on it. Uh, so, for example, in in our entire uh, artsy org, if anybody on any repo creates an issue that says RFC in the title, it'll post that into like an RFC channel, and then everybody can see that that uh, is an RFC that anybody can like actually read. But then it will also set a schedule for the next three days to remind people that this RFC exists, and then one week later to tell people that the RFC is ready to close. So it's like this like this idea of being able to like take something like a pull request and start sending messages back into the conversation can actually be expanded to almost any type of change that happens on GitHub and to try and build these really interesting, unique workflows for how you end up uh, working within your team. I kind of have a question though, like back to the linting stuff, um, sure. like where I am, we have like pre-commit hooks that run linting. What do you think is there like a benefit to not doing it then? Because I kind of like having it there, you know, before yeah. I even make a commit. I agree. That's the perfect place to have it. Um, in fact, Danger actually can run as a one of those linting steps. So like your changelog entry, it, it can compare against master to see if you've actually wrote a changelog entry as part of a pre-commit uh, or a pre-push stage. Oh, uh, okay. So, so it can be treated just as the same. So, you know, and then you can have the same check on the server side so that then it's verified at both stages, both like as you're pushing and when it's on CI. Okay. I like that better. That's good. Yeah, me too. I'm really new to the idea of all these pre-commit hooks because uh, I've only been using like Node for about a year, but it's so amazing to have all this stuff just automatically like move away so many discussions in, in code review and just kind of move it directly to the thing that you really care about, which is the code versus like the artifacts of code. Yeah, I like it too, like with the pre-commit hooks, because you can set them up like just for you as an individual, and then you can set them up for the team. So if there are certain things that you like, um, but that the team doesn't necessarily want, then you can use that for for that kind of case, which is what I do too. Yeah, I think one of the most like inspiring things this year has been the rise of Prettier, the like automatic JavaScript formatter. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right? I, uh, I spent some time this year like updating their website, and so I built an entirely new homepage for them as, as, in homage to how great this this tool really is. It, like it, it just erased so many discussions in our in our team and only made it so that we could focus on the things that we should be actually focusing on. Um, and like we try and use, use danger in a similar way. So like we all agree that we will have a test file for every new file that's added to the project. And so danger will just keep stopping you until you actually do add the test file and add the things in yourself. I think the level of automation that you can pull off in the JavaScript world is just incredible. I think it's interesting too. I mean, I'm going through a, a process in my business, you know, running the podcasts where it's, hey, look, here's the process for doing this thing, right? So we're running the React conference, for example. And so here's the process for adding a speaker and their session to the web page. And it'd be nice if there was something that was going along behind them, right? And checking them, oh, you didn't add their photo. <laughs> you didn't yeah. put in the description for the session. And it sounds like having something like Danger where it's like, it's like, look, you, you know, we're trying to get you to ingrain what the process is, but at the end of the day, um, you know, we, we want you to, uh, to follow the process and we're going to help you get reminders to do so. That's just really handy. And then people can, yeah, they can focus on the, the thinking problems instead of the, now what was the 15th step in this whole thing? <laughs> yeah. And you can also get that feedback significantly quicker if it's on CI, right? right? You don't have to wait for a human being to come back for it. Um, and so, yeah, we try and we try and almost every time we have like a retrospective, we generally agree that there's a new danger rule that we can generate from that from that retrospective, and just slowly keep building these things up. Yeah, because AJ never writes his tests, so we need to fix that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's actually a really good example. You're you're one there because um, it it wouldn't really make sense to write a unit test that somebody has added this. But it makes total sense once you start thinking of like cultural project tests to start doing it. 
and it really like until danger came along i never really considered that we could like make tests for the way that we contribute code to each other yeah so how first of all how do i put this on my own machine so if i'm working on a project um you know how, how do i put this in so that it works for me so there are two versions of danger uh free uh, four if you want to be complicated um there's Danger Ruby, which was Yay. my original implementation. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Um, Danger Ruby is like solid, mature, stable, probably will never break from this point forwards. Uh, supports like GitLab, GitHub, Bitbucket, every CI that basically exists. Um, and so you just add the gem. Uh, so add it to your gem file and then just run bundle exec danger on your CI. And uh, as long as you add a environment variable for uh, like maybe your GitHub API token or your Bitbucket API token, then that's basically your entire flow. You just create a danger file, write a little bit of Ruby to describe the rules, and you're basically good. Uh, the bit that gets complicated is like the JavaScript one is I've been working on it for about a year and a half, so it's not quite as uh, like mature. But in the trade-off, it's grown in very different ways. And so it provides like some features that the Ruby version just will never be able to do, um, which is like pretty awesome from my perspective as someone that's been working on this problem for like three years. Uh, but if you're just trying to get something done, the Ruby one's great. Now, the other question that I have is uh, with Danger, um, is, is JS the implementation language or the language for the rules? Or does it only work in JavaScript and JavaScript derived languages or Ruby for the Ruby version? Yeah, so so the Ruby version is just for Ruby, but like the iOS community uses the Ruby version. I know a bit of the Python community do, um, but the uh, the JavaScript version has this kind of this 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 process hosting mode, which means that uh, the JavaScript version can run other languages. So there's a version of Danger written in Swift that uses the Danger JavaScript kind of bootstrap oh. itself and handle like all the communications with GitHub. And um, it just handles the process of running your like Swift danger file. So the rules can be wrote in Swift, but the actual like end implementation is all done in JavaScript with communications. So it's a bit like um, XPC, if you know much about, uh, or IPC, depending on whether you've done systems processing or not. So, it's bit, so that allows you any language. So there's a Go implementation, uh, there's a Ruby implementation that uses Danger to JavaScript, um, and there's also like server implementation that separates uh, different servers can execute the same Danger files. It's a really clever abstraction. That's cool, right? I've been uh, trying to think of a way to be able to do um, what is essentially hosted Danger. So instead of you running it on CI, you can just go to a GitHub web page and just click, you know, authenticate. And then effectively, um, you can just make a JavaScript danger file, and it can be applied on every single repo on your entire org instantly. Uh, we do that for spell checking. So every single markdown file in every repo in our org is spell checked. And that's all done at server side. So you, 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 sh you ship a PR, it does it instantly because it doesn't need to run on CI. And as you just make edits, it will just slowly and slowly remove the, the spell check messages from your system. So do you just do an NPM install, make it a, yeah, for a the global executable? JavaScript. Yeah. Just, uh, well, I don't think so. I don't really believe in global executables. Uh, I, I, run a, I run the iOS dependency manager. And so every, every time I get the chance to tell someone to not install any type of global dependency, you should try and avoid that. Um, so I, I always recommend I've running, like adding it to your project and then do NPM run or yarn run to, to actually execute these things. Um, it, specifically so that versioning is just handled correctly. Um, but it really is just a case of yarn add danger and then, uh, yarn run danger in your CI with, a, once you've created the danger file, they actually have this really nice, uh, in it function that kind of introduces you to danger step by step kind of walks you through all the pieces uh, so you can actually understand what's going on because it can feel quite magical because it's just like adding a few magic global variables and executing code arbitrarily 
Um, and so I spent quite a lot of time trying to consider what does the new user flow look like for uh, someone that's maybe heard of danger but doesn't actually get the underlying ideas. And so that's usually the, the right the right way to go, just running npx uh, danger in it. That would be it. Um, so like every place I've ever worked, when we have test coverage, we just run those in CI and, you know, the build will fail if you don't pass, like either a test fails or like coverage doesn't meet the right threshold. Yeah. So how would using danger like be better than just doing something like that? I think danger, danger sits on top of something like that. Uh, so an example being that, uh, if there's a danger jest plugin, so when your jest tests run, you can make it output a JSON file, and then Danger can read that JSON file. And so instead of your fail just building, just failing at, because your CI has failed, you can actually then post a comment showing you what parts of CI has failed. So it could be about okay. Jest, it could be about TSLint, it could be about any of those things. And okay, it's about the that, communication. Okay. Yeah, that makes more sense then. So it would just tell me like, rather than me having to like click through to Jenkins and check the line number or something like yep. that, it'll just tell me right there. Okay. Right there in the comment. And then every time you do a build, it will update that same comment. So yeah, you'll, okay. you'll always know. I can see how that would be. Just the, the feedback loop would be a little bit faster there and just like not having to click through to something else. Yeah. I mean, it's really nice that it, uh, it just shows it in Slack. So if you've only got one or two things and it'll show you the, the top of the message and you'll know exactly where to go without even having to go to GitHub to go look at it. So what kinds of rules can you write for this system? Well, part of it is that it's just a you know a Turing complete language. So literally anything you can write in Ruby or JavaScript, you can you can just do. Um, like some of the more interesting ones are um, so React, the uh, like the JavaScript framework. Every time someone runs a, a PR on React, it will try and figure out whether the PR has changed the distributed build sizes. So it will, it will run through the full build process, and then it will compare the like the sort of gzipped file size of uh, the build compared to the previous version. And so Danger will tell you if you have actually increased the bytes of the distributed build file that will eventually get released. So it can it can range from like pretty complex like that to. Um, and like we have a pretty trivial one that says that counts the amount of lines of code. And if the lines of code is, let's say, over a thousand, then it just puts a, a warning in the pull request that this is a really large PR. And we don't really want to be doing that too often. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the big open source projects we run, uh, we check to see if the person that submitted the PR is inside the org of, the, uh, of whatever that uh, open source project is. And if they're not, um, we'll tell them that they're going to be added to the org after this PR is merged as a part of like our policy and that it's okay. Uh, there's a low pressure, low pressure responsibility, but like it's about setting the messaging right uh, and reminding the actual admins that they should be adding people. So a lot of it's just basically like, what is the internal process of your actual teams? So that's change logs for me, for us, always change logs. Yeah, I like the idea where it's 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 not just what's going on in the code, but what's going on with the system as a whole. Yeah, we use a thing called React Storybooks, and so we we have like checks that every new React component includes a storybook reference. Those are the kind of things that like you know you, you can occasionally just get lazy and just skip on, but a lot of the time having that reminder that you said you would do this. Uh -huh. uh, you know, as a team, you agreed on it, then you can just, you know, codify it in some way. Also provide an escape clause, you know, because you can't assume every single PR will need that. Um, but make sure that you can, you know, kind of live up to your word. And for us, we were, you know, a growing team and we wanted to be able to say like, these, this is the way that we behave and we can set ourselves to, higher standards by automating away, like us having to tell each other these kind of things. One other thing that I could see is you could set up rules. You mentioned uh, retrospectives. And in a lot of cases, it's, yeah, we need to do this a little bit better. But in a lot of cases, too, if you're doing like real, true, agile development, 
it's we're going to do this as an experiment for a little while and then we're going to change it. And so you can put the rule in there to remind people to do it the way that you said you were going to do it with the understanding that that rule may come out in a week or two and then yep. a new rule will go in or we'll tweak the rule because we feel like this, that, or the other needs to change. Yeah, completely. It's just source code in your repo. So, you know, the rules change as your team culture changes. And, like, it, it should be a living document that everybody feels, you know, that they can contribute to. Uh, it's just, a, yeah, it's a really nice way of codifying those kind of team rules as you change. I agree. So was it the PRs that inspired this, or was it something else that made you think, oh, this would be a really nice for this, that, or the other? Um, I, I believe that open source is generally uh, asymmetric. There's, a, you know, it's like for every, I don't know, every few thousand people, there's generally one contributors in that set of people. And I've been running large open source projects since uh, 2012, 2013, uh, with like users in the hundreds of thousands. So a lot of it's been about just trying to set expectations of people that are either submitting code or, um, well, yeah, that's really it. Like get enough drive-by pull requests that we wanted to try and find a way to automate the kind of expectations that we had of people. Um, a few people had tried attacking the problem by building one-off projects, but instead I opted to try and build a system that allows you to generate those kind of rules. Um, and so like danger kind of evolved out of this too many people contributing to a project with too few maintainers. Um, and it gave us the ability to say, these are the things that we can, we would normally tell people. I feel like that hit react native really hard. They have a ton of, of like one off PRs that are red and break things and aren't fully tested. Um, because you know, it's a bunch of, you know, JavaScript people contributing to a native code base that they may not have much experience with. And so for them, like using something like Danger can actually really substantially get people into a state where they can contribute at a at a at a level that makes them feel comfortable to actually spend time working in the open on it. Because engineers working on React Native are working for Facebook. They're not working for React Native. And so their time is only on Facebook product and helping out on React Native rather than actually improving the li well, not improving the library, but improve the library for Facebook and maintaining the open source world part of it is like probably classed as a chore internally. So having something that can set people up to get to a good place before they even get to read it is super useful in those contexts. This episode is sponsored by Codacy. If you want to improve code quality, prevent bugs, and secure liabilities for making it into your production and, at the same time, speed up your code review process by 20%, then you need to try Codacy. Codacy makes it easy to track code quality and code coverage and to identify and fix issues by automatically checking your commits and pull requests against all the most widely used static analysis tools. Codacy helps build great teams that build great software. So join companies like Delivery Hero, PayPal, Samsung, and more and try it for free through GitHub or Bitbucket. If you use the code JSJabber at checkout, you will get a 10% discount. That's Codacy, C-O-D-A-C-Y dot com. So, so is the React Native team using Danger then? Yep. Uh, like, I think, yeah, React Native team, the React team, uh, Apollo, um, and that's, that's uh, the React RxJS. They're all the big projects that are using it in the JavaScript world. Um, they're all generally ones that get, have, you know, few maintainers, many contributors, and that's generally where you tend to, like, need this kind of, this kind of tool when you're in uh, open source, when you like, otherwise you kind of do it to really tighten your team culture internally, which is what we do in our org. Gotcha. I've always been curious what it takes to write a utility like this, especially one that gives people the kind of feedback that they actually need. Uh, how much work is that? How, what does it take to actually get this right? Uh, realistically, Danger has taken about three years of my full spare time life. So it'll be in the thousands of hours, maybe, maybe, maybe tens of thousands of hours. So a lot of that's like building documentation, uh, like 
handling like API differences between different types of CI providers, or GitHub and Bitbucket. Then I had to rewrite it in JavaScript because we moved all of our native code to JavaScript, and it's and we needed, and it started to feel wrong having JavaScript rules inside uh, Ruby JavaScript Ruby <laughs> Danger. I know it's all confusing. Um, <laughs> So realistically, like you know, I've 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 just been building developer tools in my spare time for I think the last six or seven years, starting with dependency managers, moving into danger, and a lot of it's just a case of sometimes you just see a problem and you try and persuade enough people to do it, and no one does it, so you just have to do it yourself. Um, danger Ruby is a good example of I managed to persuade at least two or three other people to actually contribute on a meaningful level. So maintaining that's much less of a problem for me because I don't have to maintain it too hard. And it's classed as now a mature done project. So there's not much need to push it forwards in the way that I am with Jane JavaScript. Um, so a lot of it's like building relationships, making them last, and trying to, trying to find time to work on the things that are important to you. And also trying to persuade people to build the things that are important to them. Uh, I don't really want to build the GitLab support or the Bitbucket support because I don't use any of them. But I know that there's a lot of people that will use it. So how can I provide enough documentation that people can understand how to build it themselves and make it stand up long enough that I can get proper tests in it and we can cover it and then it can stay? So a lot of that's the kind of grunt work of, of like serious dev tool uh, like side projects, I think, just trying to set expectations and trying to improve the the state for everybody. And I think you know, there's there's just so many of these projects out there that uh, you know, one or two people that have been doing it for many years. Um, and I keep seeing really cool projects like Open Collective and Tide Lift that are trying to find ways to kind of like provide people with both admin and money in order to like make open source work in the long run. So I'm, I, I don't really think I want to be working on danger full time, but I know that there's a lot of tools that I wish other people would work on full time. Um, and so I'd love to see more like general cultural acceptance of those, of the kind of uh, organizational tools that give people the ability to get paid for working on these kind of projects. So what do you mean by uh, cultural acceptance? Where do you feel like there's a problem with cultural acceptance on this? I think it's more a case of like, uh, you know, I don't really want to get paid to work on open source. Like there's there's a definite like feeling that getting paid muddies the water a little bit about your your side project work. And so it's very hard to get from this kind of, it's my side project, so I don't need to make money on it to it's my full-time project and I think that's a very big gap so it's not like uh, it, it's not like you see many projects that are making like a hundred dollars a month uh, which you end up seeing like webpack makes tens of thousands of dollars a month uh, versus like danger which makes nothing or um, you know some of like if, I'm not sure I think there's just not a, like there's, there's not like a small middle class of uh, of projects being funded i think it only really affects the biggest ones and the smallest ones just kind of uh, no one really gets the time to work on them yeah well the other thing is is that if it's if it's helping cover a car payment or you know something like that it it makes it a little bit easier for you to be happy to spend another hour on the weekend helping somebody else with the project as opposed to you know when you have somebody breathing down your neck about some (laughs) issue that you're not really sure necessarily needs to be fixed in the first place and they're screaming and yelling about you and you're like hey dude i i I do this on my friday nights instead of playing with my kids so back the heck off yeah and if there's a little bit coming (laughs) your way then then you feel a little bit better about you know keeping on with it a little longer it just makes it a little bit easier to maintain and the other thing is is that some of these projects get uh, adopted by or sponsored by large companies and a lot of the large yeah. companies, so you see this with like, um, you know, Angular and a lot of the things that the Angular team does are out there to serve the community, whereas others are dr- specifically to serve Google. And some yeah. companies are a little more heavy handed in the, hey, fix our issues and make it work for us better. 
um, sometimes at the expense of the community version. And so if you, if you have community support in the first place, it's a little easier for somebody to not be beholden so much to people or businesses that are, you know, sponsoring or helping them out one way or the other. But that's an entirely different episode that we probably ought to do sometime. <laughs> yeah. I didn't mean to giggle at your at what you were saying. I was just you seemed you were very you had a very strong opinion there, but I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I think the interesting thing is that um a lot of like a lot of companies can can just help by understanding that the things that they depend on they can improve, especially if it's in the open source world. Like, you know, anyone that can write, anyone that can write a node app can probably contribute to their dependency tree. Uh, but the hard bit is like culturally feeling like you can do that and being able to say like, it's important for us to maintain this project in order for us to continue building the business that we're actually doing. Um, and I think it's taken us a few years to get to a point now where I work at Artsy that like, you know, I can say that I have to work on one of our dependencies in order for us to build the things that we need to build and to continue making them being built. But I'm, I, it took a long time, and I'm sure a lot of other companies are nowhere near that point yet. Well, it also occurs to me that if you're using open source software, you didn't have to pay one of your developers to write it. If you're using something like Danger, then you're saving your team at least a little bit of time doing some of the more mundane checks on the code. And so it's adding value to you. And if you give even a tenth of that value back, um, the, the, communi the community can widely support a lot of these projects. Yeah, I strongly agree. Well, I think the part of the problem there is the better you are at being like a marketer, then the better you are going to have finding funding. And so it's an entirely different. It's like, hey, I really just want to support this project, but now I got to become a promoter and a fun, yeah. you know, a marketer. There's a lot of truth to that. Yeah, it's like, I mean, it's part of the whole, like, how, how do you even know these things exist? Like, the, the community is, all of these communities are so large that actually being heard can be very difficult. Um, and, like, a lot of it's based on GitHub stars or, you know, podcasts like these where, you know, you hear the links at the end and you're like, ah, oh, that's that exactly solves my problem. How did I not know that it's existed for the last five years? Um like you can't exactly make a, an index of all projects. And so discoverability is such a problem. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, if people want to get more information about danger, what's the best place to do that? Uh, it's got a brilliant website, danger.systems. Nice. I <laughs> love it. It has both uh, the Ruby and web uh, and JavaScript sides. Uh, and while, while I've got you, the JavaScript side is really interesting, actually. Every time uh, a new build of the website is made, so every time it's a new version of Danger or one of its plugins is updated, it creates an entirely new um, like color scheme based off a random tweet from a, a, a particular bot account. So like, if you go back once a week, it'll usually have a completely different like feel. It's fabulous. Nice. And if people want to see what you're working on, do you have a blog or Twitter account or... Is it all on GitHub? What, where's your stuff? Yeah, I'm a I'm a hundred percent open source. Uh, so I'm just Orta O R T A on all of those things. Um, and generally speaking, I actually use my the company's blog to write most of my most interesting works. Uh, so look at the blog for Artsy Art S Y, um, and you'll find anything that I've wrote that's interesting there. Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and do some picks. For you, the listeners of JavaScript Jabber, Loot Crate is offering an opportunity to save 10% on any new subscription at LootCrate.com. Just enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Loot Crate is one of my favorite things. Every month I get a box in the mail, costs less than $20, and it comes with all kinds of goodies. I have stuff from just looking at my shelf, Batman, Spider-Man, Ninja Turtles, Back to the Future, Lord of the Rings... Star Wars, and much, much more. So if you're a geek, a gamer, anything like that, and you want cool stuff to put around your office, cool t-shirts, comic books, etc., then definitely check out Loot Crate. To save 10% on your new subscription, go to lootcrate.com slash ruby. Again, that's lootcrate.com slash ruby to save 10% on any new subscription. Enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Amy, do you want to start us off with our picks? 
Sure. And I do have a couple. Um, so as I was kind of looking into danger for this episode, I stumbled across Max, Sto- I can never say his name, Stoiber, his blog. And uh, he actually uses it for his projects. So uh, he talks about like if anybody, um, I guess, wants to check out the project. So he's using it in style components. Um, and I know we talked about like with Jest. So uh, I guess check out his blog and check out this post. I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, the other thing, so, um, you know, new developers as they're like trying to get the first job or whatever, they're always like, uh, hitting this issue. And it's a, you know, question I get asked a lot, um, about like take home challenges and stuff like that. So I think I saw this on Hacker News, but somebody, um, put together a website, uh, called fullstackinterviewing.com. And there's an article on here, the ultimate guide to kicking ass on take home coding challenges. So like one of the things in here that I know people kind of will ask is like, do I write tests? And um, the answer is, in my opinion, and as this blog states, the answer is yes. <laughs> so it, <laughs> it, it, it asks a lot of questions like that. Um, I don't know. It, it, there's, it goes into pretty good depth. And uh, I really, really like um, just how kind of like off the cuff this person is and in their responses and stuff. So anyways, I'll put a link for that as well in the show notes. And that's it for me. All right, Joe, what are your picks? All right. I got a couple of picks for you here. Um, The first one, these are both game related. So I'm actually going to be spending the weekend at a board gaming convention here in Utah. Super excited. It's cool. It's kind of our, yeah, yeah, super awesome. It's kind of our celebration for our, my wife, my, the anniversary between my wife and I when we got married. Uh, so I'm really excited to be heading out to that. And so, wait, when and where is it? <laughs> it's up in uh, Layton, just north of Salt Lake. It's this weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Uh, everybody's um, going to join you now. <laughs> <laughs> well, by the time this gets published, it's over. But <laughs> Chuck and AJ and Amy and can we uh, all join you? <laughs> yeah, Arta, you guys are all well, welcome to come. Please I'm come. Sure yeah. my, well, my, love that. <laughs> my wife and I are celebrating our 13th wedding anniversary this weekend oh. as well. So. Oh, happy anniversary to all you guys. Yeah, happy anniversary. Yeah. So, in in conjunction with that, I'm going to pick sure the the conference, which is called SaltCon. Um, not to be confused with Salt Conf with an F. It's just <laughs> Con without the F. They're two totally different things. I'm sure. Um, but uh, I played a board game recently with my kids that was actually a really fun, very unique board game. So if you have kids and you're uh, looking for a unique kind of a board game or you've always had – you maybe yourself were enjoyed Dungeons & Dragons or wanted to get into it, this kind of a mix of board games and a role-playing game like Dungeons & Dragons. And there's a few games like this out such as Mice and Mystics. But this one's called Stuffed Fables. And the people that are playing play stuffed animals – that are protecting their little girl when she goes to sleep from the monsters under the bed. And uh, it's think a little bit of Toy Story uh, mixed with maybe uh, what's the Disney movie about the emotions? Um, um, oh, Inside Out? Inside, Inside. Yeah, is it Inside Out? Yeah. Yep. Uh, think kind of a little bit like that, but you're playing stuffed animals. And it's got a really unique format. There's this storybook and you turn over a page and on the right is the rules. And on the left is sort of the map, the board that you're on. And you do something, you have to get to the next spot. And it might be like you're in a pile of toys and there's a train that's leaving with the stuff, <laughs> with the blanket that your little girl has and you're trying to rescue it. So you got to get to the train and there's certain rules and conditions. You got to work together to get there. And if you don't make it in time, then you have to walk. But if you do make it on the train, then you get to ride to the, and if you have to walk, you have to go to the next page. And if you make it on the train, you go two pages ahead and, and you just turn the page and there's the new map. It's really fun. And it's got these cute little stuffed animal characters that you play and you can pick up, they can search and pick up items like, you know, scissors and stuff to use as weapons when they're attacking the bad cre- uh, creatures. And um, I just had a super fun time. My kids are a little bit older, 13 to 19, but they really enjoyed it. And I think it would be also very fun for kids that are b- a bit younger as well. So Stuffed Fables is my first uh, pick. And then I'll pick Salt Con as well as my second pick. And there you go. All right. What are your picks, AJ? So I got some good picks for you today, boys and girls. We got, first off, the Unify AC Lite. So if you like Wi-Fi that works, um, then you must also be using this already because that's the only one I've ever known that works, and I've never heard anyone else talk about any other one that works. So 
So this is useless for you. But if you'd like to like Wi-Fi that works, the Unify oh, system is really cool. It's 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 a business grade system, but the setup is actually really easy. There's there's a couple things in there that are that are maybe like they're questions that that are a little. I don't want to use the word confusing. It's just because it's a business setup. I don't know. It, it, the setup is different, but it's not. I don't think that it's difficult. I don't think that it's more difficult than the average router, but it's different. And um, or not router, excuse me, access point. It's a it's an access point, so you have to have a router still. But it's got good range. It works well. It's pretty sweet. Um, but if you're timid, then maybe don't try it because it is different than what you're used to, and you do need to have a router with it. It doesn't. It's not a. It's not a standalone router. It's only an access point. Uh, other thing that I'll pick. Oh, and the reason I, I pick it is because my. Um, I had one before, but I bought it used, and it was an older version, and it finally kind of gave up the ghost, and so I. I bought their newest one for ninety bucks, which is way cheaper than most of the Wi-Fi access point router combos um, and then just plugged it back in where the other one was before and it's singing like a like an angel <clears throat> and the other thing i'll pick is full metal alchemist um because i i picked mistborn and i think that if you wanted to watch an anime that's like what the book of mistborn is i some people might argue with me i i haven't really talked to a lot of people about this yet but i think full metal alchemist alchemist is is your is your tv show or or anime to watch and apparently they just came out with a live action version i didn't even know that so i'm going to watch that and i'll report back on how that is awesome i'm going to jump in here with a couple of picks um joe made me think of a game that i got my wife for her birthday it, it all kind of stacks up at my house right um my daughter's birthday is on valentine's day and we also have valentine's day and then my wife's birthday is about nine days after valentine's day and then our anniversary is usually about nine days after that and so, uh, yeah, anyway, fe February gets busy. Um, anyway, I got her the Harry Potter, it's a collaborative uh, card deck building game, Hogwarts Battles, I think is what it's called. And I got her the expansion, the expansion for it, but we haven't played the expansion yet. Uh, it is a ton of fun. We had a good time. Um, usually when we go, we, we went on a trip with her dad and her sister and brother-in-law. And usually when we go on this trip, it's like, okay, we're exhausted because we go to the St. George Parade of Homes. So we go walk through houses all day, um, you know, just looking at these brand new houses and the new stuff they're putting in them. And then we go back to the uh, condo that we're staying at and crash. Well, in this case, we went back to the condo and we would play uh, Hogwarts Battles for another like five or six hours. And then we would wake up in the morning going, why did we stay up all night? <laughs> and then we, we went out and saw more houses and then we did it again. Do you have? Did you get the uh, expansion for it? We did, <clears throat> but we haven't played it yet. We haven't played the expansion because you start I just with got that. You start with year one, and then year two, and then year three, and so on. And so yeah, we're super on, cool. Yeah, we're on year five, I think. So anyway, super fun game. Um, but we're we we love doing uh, the board games, which is why I might surprise her with tickets to SaltCon for Saturday. Um, but anyway, so that that's a lot of fun. We really, really enjoy that. And um, yeah, there's another game that we played a couple times um, with her mom and stepsister and, and, and all of them uh, called Sushi Go Party. And that's a super fun game, too. Um, it's, it's a little bit different. So you have uh, different, basically, sushi menus that you set up. And then you get different points for the different kinds of things on the menu. Um, and that there are different rules for the different cards, but you play a card and then pass your hand to the right and then play a card and pass your hand to the right. And so, you you know, you, you can't always plan on what you're going to be able to pay, play, but some of the cards are you get points for every three you get. So if you have two of them, they're not worth anything. Um, or if you, you're the only one that plays the card on that round. And so, you know, you, you have no idea. You know what the people ahead of you probably have? But you don't really know that either. So anyway, it's it's a fun game, and it's and one you, that you got to play it through once to learn it. You can't like yeah. sit down and try to explain it to people. You have to just play it and let the first round be confusing. Because I try to play it with my family, and they got all up and off. Oh, this is too hard. No, just like play it through once. Then it's fun. The first round isn't fun. Second round's fun. Yep. And third and fourth, fifth. <laughs> so it's it's a good one. So I'm gonna pick that, and then um. The last thing that I'm going to pick is we were talking to Orta before the show 
Um, so a year and a half ago was my first time in New York City. And I just was wandering through Times Square with um, a couple of the guys from the iFreak show and AJ. And I ran across a guy who was selling basically tickets that'll get you into three or four attractions. And so I picked the ones that I wanted to go see. And it turns out that uh, that, that ticket... And it was just some guy on the street, but it was totally legit. They let me into all these places. Um, it would have cost me about 80 or 90 bucks to go see all those things. And the ticket itself cost 40 or 50 bucks. So um, if you plan ahead, I think you can actually order some of those online because um, they had a website and go get them. anyway. So uh, if you're looking to go see like the Statue of Liberty and all that stuff, then uh, I recommend you do that. Save yourself some dough. One thing that I'm also going to point out, if you're going out there and you think you want to see the Statue of Liberty, you have to register in advance to be able to go into the statue. And so I didn't realize that at the time, and uh, I kind of wish I'd been able to do that. So I think next time I go out there, if they, uh, if Microsoft has this come out again, um, I'll probably just plan way in advance and see if I can get on the list to go in. But they have to run a background check and stuff because they don't want people going in there and vandalizing it or you know, blowing it up or whatever. Anyway, the security's pretty hefty going in to the statue. So anyway, uh those are my picks. Orta, what are your picks? Uh so I'm gonna I'm gonna do two sections of picks. Um the first is the quick one. So I'd recommend that everybody watch the wire. Uh it's it's an old but uh it's damn good. I only got around to watching it like the end of the at the start of this year and I still can't stop thinking about it. Um, if you like that kind of thing, then you'll probably also like a book called Worm. It's a it's like a online publication that's been released on a, like three times a week for a few years. So it's super good. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to talk about is that I think this year is going to be the year that JavaScript contributes to other communities in a big way. Um, so like you can see this pattern emerging. So Webpack supports Rust. Jest supports like JavaScript. Uh, wait, Jest supports running like tests in other languages. Prettier supports running, uh, prettifying other languages. So like Prettier runs on PHP, Swift, Ruby, uh, and Danger does the same thing too. Like I think lots of there's lots of space now in the JavaScript community to start thinking about how the great tooling that we build can actually start affecting other communities, uh, and so. I want instead of a link, I want you to think about what what other things that could be to like do there. Very cool. Sounds good. Well, we'll have to get you on Ruby Rogues to talk about danger for Ruby. And uh, yeah, thanks yeah. for coming and talking to us about uh, basically automating processes for your applications. Ooh. All right, we will wrap this up, and we'll catch everyone next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.